The Welsh Government's lifting the stay at home requirement in Wales from tomorrow and replacing it with stay local. And I'm joined by First Minister Mark Drakeford this afternoon. As you ease Wales slowly out of lockdown, what can people expect over the coming weeks? Well, they can expect a careful, cautious, step by step approach. But a start on the genuine journey now out of lockdown here in Wales. Uh, as you said, the stay at home rule that we've had for many weeks now lifted tomorrow. People will be able to travel in their own local area. Hairdressers and barbers will resume work on the 15th of March. Shops that are already open will be able to sell the full range of goods from the 22nd. And if things remain on track, then on the 27th of March, we will be able to allow self-contained accommodation in the tourism sector to reopen. At the same time, we'll be bringing more children back to school. We will be allowing visits in care homes and we'll be looking to the 12th of April where all children are back in school, all non-essential retailers open and all close contact services are working again as well. In the last review, you mentioned non-essential retail will be considered for reopening during this review and independent traders feel disappointed by today's announcement. Well, I said three weeks ago that we would start the reopening of non-essential retail over these, these three weeks, and that's exactly what we are doing. Up until now, supermarkets and other shops that are open have only been able to sell a limited range of essential goods. On the 22nd of March, they will be able to sell everything that they would normally sell, and thousands and thousands of people in Wales will now be able to buy things that they've not been able to buy for many weeks. And for those other shops that aren't open at the moment and have to prepare themselves to reopen, they now know that on the 12th of April that will be possible. And in the meantime, we're mobilising £150 million in additional help to support those businesses in the weeks between now and then. We've been approached by the outdoor tourism sector and campsites asking for dates so they can plan towards the future. Do you have news on that? Uh, well, we're starting with self-contained accommodation. That's what we did last year. It's for the industry to make a success of that. People will be going back to communities who haven't seen anybody, no visitors at all, for weeks upon weeks. And you know, we've got to understand the anxiety that those communities feel about visitors being amongst them once again. That's why we have to start with the safest and the smallest step. Last year, we then did go on to reopen outdoor attractions and campsites. And I remain hopeful that provided things continue to improve, we'll be able to take that next step as well. But it is for the industry to make a success of the first things we can offer them, because that gives us and them the platform to go on to do more. As more school year groups return to the classroom, I've been approached by teachers, teachers who told me they're already experiencing COVID cases and pupils having to isolate. Would it not be more sensible to ensure everyone has had the jab before a full return to the classroom? Well, we've agreed with our teacher unions and with the local education authorities that we will bring children back to school not in one big bang, but in three separate stages so that that can be done as safely as possible. Uh, we've tested 80,000 teachers. Sorry, maybe I should make sure I got that completely right. 80,000 lateral flow tests have now been used by teachers. And the percentage that turned out to be positive was less than 0.1%. And I hope that that will give people confidence that the classroom is safe, that we put everything in place to make it safe and that we continue to bring children back in a gradual, phased way to make sure that they and their teachers go on being as safe as possible. You're proceeding with care home residents being able to receive visitors again. That starts on Monday. How difficult has it been to manage the crisis to ensure vulnerable people are protected whilst also being aware of their mental health and the fact that they'll probably be feeling quite lonely? I think it's been one of the most difficult balancing acts in the whole of the pandemic. We know that if the virus gets into a care home, it can be devastating to the whole of that population. And yet we know as well that people who live in residential care are desperate to see friends and family. 
So I'm really glad that we are able to restore uh, indoor visits in care homes from the start of next week. It'll be one designated visitor. It'll be done under carefully controlled circumstances. But the fact that we've had huge success in our vaccination programme with care home residents and care home staff gives us the confidence that this is now the right moment to make that move. Today you revealed that 40% of people in Wales have been offered the first vaccine. Because of the speed of that rollout, do you think this could be the last lockdown for Wales? Well, I absolutely hope so. Nobody wants to be going back over this again. But just as there are some very good things happening, numbers down, vaccination numbers up, we've got new variants emerging in different parts of the world. We've got some parts of Wales that are not in the position that the rest of Wales uh, are in. And even when we do the most we can with vaccination, there'll still be a significant proportion of the population who've chosen not to have it or where it won't be giving them full protection. So I'm afraid there are tricks up the sleeve of this vaccine still, and we've just got to go on being really vigilant, watching every move we make and making sure we keep Wales safe. I think you're the first year to being quite honest and saying that these restrictions will probably stay in place until the end of 21, even looking ahead to 22. What's your take on this then? Do you think that um, we, are, we are going to see a, a slow phasing out that will take us through now the next few months, but potentially we might see a tightening again around the autumn, winter months and then a lessening again as we go 22? I think it is just very sensible for us to be aware that over the last 12 months, this virus has had a seasonal effect. It doesn't like the sunlight. It doesn't like outdoors. And in the months ahead of us now, where we're able to make full advantage of that, then you know the virus, I hope, will be successfully suppressed and we can offer more freedoms to people. But come the autumn, as the days draw in and it's less possible to mix outdoors, we've just got to be alert to the fact that we could see the virus beginning to spread again. And uh, let's hope that with vaccination and everything else, we can still keep it effectively suppressed. But it's just not honest with people to pretend uh, that everything is going to return to normal in the way we would all like it to, as quickly as we would like. We're going to be living with the virus for a while yet. You're going to have to do some quick answers on these now. I've got some listeners' questions. I put them to them on Facebook and this is what they came back with. John in Manchester's booked a holiday cottage in West Wales for Easter. He says he might be able to fly to Manchester on a foreign holiday before he can come here. He's asking you, how are you going to stop Welsh people flying out of Liverpool or Manchester if the ban on foreign holidays is lifted in England? Uh, if a ban on foreign holidays is lifted in England, it's not feasible to not lift it here uh, in Wales. John won't be able to travel to West Wales, I'm afraid, from Manchester for Easter because the rules in England will prevent him from doing that. You mentioned earlier outdoor gyms can reopen. Phil Jones is a personal trainer in the Swansea area. He wants to know, does that mean he can start holding outdoor classes? He can with three other uh, adults, provided they are from no more than two households. So he can have himself and three other people from one household uh, or himself and two other people uh, do you see what I mean? I'm sorry. Let me, let me just say that again to be clear as I can. Yes, he can, but only four people from two households can meet outdoors. So he'd have to be able to operate within that uh, framework. Mama 3, Claire Anderson from Mumbles is asking how long before children can go back to play team sports at their local clubs? Uh, going to try to reopen organised children activities outdoors during the Easter holidays. And we'll be talking with the governing bodies and others to see how far we can make that happen. But we'll make a start on that at the very least over the Easter period. Lots of fans. The big question, when can they expect a return to our stadiums? Uh, well, I'm hopeful that we will be able to have some pilots of that uh, during the spring. Uh, we've got lateral flow tests as well as vaccination, you know, those rapid turnaround tests. And we need to think through with our colleagues across the border and in Scotland how we might best be able to use those so that people can return uh, to 
sporting events, to the theatre, to all the other things that we used to enjoy so much and haven't been able to do for the last 12 months. We'll still want to do it safely. We still won't, won't want to do it in a way that brings loads of people together and causes enormous risks. Food banks have seen a big increase in demand. And Tracy Johns at Vernon Place Community Hub in Britain Ferry wants to know, will there be more additional support for COVID related funding for community hubs and food banks? Yeah, looking forward to being able to do that. We've uh, spent a lot of money, quite rightly in the Welsh Government, providing greater digital support. Sometimes that's been to children, to making sure that they can learn online and at home. Sometimes it's been to community groups. Uh, that journey is clearly not over. And in the next Senate term, uh, we have money set aside in our budget to allow us to continue to respond to the crisis. And I hear absolutely what Tracy says. Rob Nichols from Skewing runs Veterans Reorg. It supports former armed forces personnel in South Wales. He's seen a rise in crisis calls. He envisages the problem of mental health increasing. He's supporting a veteran with long COVID. Will you be putting in place long COVID clinics and support? The approach we are taking to long COVID is that we should offer services as close to where people live as possible. Because if you are suffering from long COVID, then long journeys to specialist clinics far from your home are not going to be easy for you to accomplish. So there's a lot of help online, which suits some people. And the first line of defence after that is to contact your own GP, who will, you know, who will be equipped to give you advice and uh, treatment where necessary. We are going to have some specialist centres, but they're not the first line uh, of treatment that we will be offering, because we think it's better to be able to make sure that people who are suffering from long COVID don't have to travel long distances to get the help they need. And to end, Fran Imanar Life says, Mark, you've had a tough job to do this year. How are you doing? Well, Fran, uh, thank you very much indeed. I'm very lucky. Uh, I've been fit and healthy myself uh, all the way through. It has been a challenge. You know, the days are long and the decisions uh, are difficult, but I've got a great team of people who help me uh, to do it. and. The messages I get from people like Fran help me to keep going every day.